So everybody knows me, I think. Um, Julio Tin, I'm the Dean of McCormick. We created this series only for PhD students. There is no one else allowed here except you guys. So the idea is that you are like me. You came here because you pick one department, because that department looked really good to you. And Northwestern was a secondary consideration. Okay, that's why I ended up in Minnesota, because at the time in which I applied, it was the number one department, I went there. I didn't pay any attention to anything in the university as a whole. But it didn't take me long to figure out that part of the value of being in a good place is that you have access to lots of talent. And you can just finish your PhD without ever looking right or left. But you are not going to be broadly educated. Okay? So the idea is, what can we offer to broaden your, view, your viewpoint? And today, for example, we have Joel Mokir. He's probably the, the foremost economic historian in the country. He basically invented the field. Uh, he's someone who has, we have here one of his books, probably the last one, but like this, he has 11 other ones, I think. I think a dozen books. And he's one of the deepest thinkers in how technology affects the world. So how many of you are for the talk of the ABB CTO today? OK, a few. So the role of that fellow, the CTO of ABB, is how to improve ABB performance, OK? Uh, Joel's viewpoint will be how ABB and Accenture and everybody who is doing something with whatever is the frontiers of technology is affecting the world. Okay. So Joel is one of those rare individuals who has two titles following his name. He's um, the Strauss Professor in Economics and History here in Northwestern, but is the Sackler Professor also in Tel Aviv. Uh, he was educated in, well, he was born in Netherlands, I think, educated in Israel, and then he has a PhD from Yale. So we are really lucky to be in a university that has such an array of intellectual power, and one of the best exponents of this is Joel Mokir. Joel. Thank you. Right, well, thank you, Julio. Uh, I'm going to go straight to the point. Let me just ask a question. How many of you have taken courses in economics as an undergraduate? OK, so a considerable amount. That's good. So because I'm, there'll be a little bit of economics terminology. Nothing, nothing insane, but, but just, just to care. All right, so I'm going to start off with this new wave of techno-pessimism in which people have all kinds of misgivings about uh, technology. And there's sort of two schools here. One is the school that's sort of represented by my uh, eminent but uh, misguided colleague, Robert J. Gordon, who uh, basically, together with many others, basically thinks that the good times in technological progress have been over. We're no longer capable of innovating as much as we did. You know, the, the, the metaphor people use is the low-hanging fruits have been picked. And all the easy things that could be invented have been invented. And now, um, you know, we're just mopping up. But that's basically it. So if they're right, then uh, productivity growth may slow down. In fact, it is fairly slow these days, although that's not necessarily the ca going to be the case in the future which may be bad for long-term economic growth and long-term economic welfare. But if that's the case, then those, if you're worried about job growth, it's probably the good news because productivity is not growing very quickly. That means many people are going to keep their jobs. There is also another school, which is also techno-pessimistic, which is exactly the opposite, which is that this sort of apocalyptic view 
that uh, sees the world in which humans would eventually be replaced by machines. Now, you know, some of this is some frightful combination of evil robots and nasty artificial intelligence, and all kinds of sinister ways in which uh, non-humans but intelligent creations are going to form, create some kind of dystopia. So there are all kind of famous people here, uh, you know, including uh, the late Stephen Hawking and uh, you know, Elon Musk, Nick Bostrom. I mean, these are people come from different places. They're all worried about this. Um, some economists, like, like my friend Eric Brynjolfsson, uh, have subscribed to this in a somewhat more sophisticated uh, version. So the good news is, of course, that n these schools cannot both be right, okay, either one or the other. The even better news is that they can both be wrong. And um, I'm going to leave aside these sort of dystopia, sort of machine, eat, eat people kind of things. Um, there are these sort of various Kurzweilian singularities that are predicted in the future. And there's this wonderful novel that uh, Kurt Vonnegut wrote uh, in the 50s called Player Piano, in which he depicts this society in which nobody works and everybody has been replaced by machines. Instead, what I'm really going to be worried about is how does technological progress affect labor markets? And how did it do so in the past? And what can we learn from the past about the future? And, and so just one remark, I tend to be very skeptical of the view that all the low-hanging technological fruits have been picked. Uh, I don't think all the easy inventions have been made. They look easy now, now that they've been, <laughs> they've been made. They didn't look easy at the time that people were working on them. People tried to harness electricity for over a century, and it, was, you know, it seems easy now. It wasn't easy then. So I think this is clearly not true. There is a bunch of paper that came out uh, this year, and there's many others who have. Uh, so any, anybody who's interested in that, just send me an email, and I'll be glad to send you stuff. But what, assuming I'm right, and that the pace of technological change will continue as fast or faster than it has been for the last 200 years, what's going to happen to work? What's going to happen to jobs? Um, will there really be some kind of technological unemployment in which we're all reduced to these sort of funny looking characters in the Wall-E movie in which we're sitting and you know we're doing nothing and we're completely uh, life is in these dystopian scenarios is really sort of seem, seem to be very people are really vapid and dreary and you know, devoid of any meaning and you know life is just really terrible well we'll see about that but so here is the, a sort of a survey of the literature there. They already mentioned Kurt Vonnegut. There's a pop econ version by a man called uh, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, came out well, 20 years ago now, in which he predicted, called The End of Work, I think the book is called. And then there's all kind of apocalyptic views. I mean, there's a historian called uh, Yuval Noah Harari in, in 2017. Here's a quote. The creation of a massive new unworking class, a useless class, who will not be merely unemployed, they will be unemployable. It sounds really uh, 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 scary. And then a famous economist, Le uh, Vasily Leontiev, who won the Nobel Prize, although not for that, uh, um, who basically said that in the 20th century, workers would end up like horses in the 19th. Okay, so they've lost their economic function, and now they, all they are, they are sort of reduced to being expensive hobbies. You know, that's kind of a, a scary thing. So here's the whole literature, anybody who cares about this. I mean, I'm certainly not the only one working on this. So I'm an economic historian, as Julio said, and my, my first reaction, of course, is we've seen this movie before, uh, more than once. And in the past, whenever technological change started to accelerate, uh, people often feared that machines would make them redundant and replace them and make them sort of unnecessary. And so they resisted technological progress and they resisted mechanization as much as they could. So this is a very famous thing that many of you may have heard. This is, the, of course, the Luddite riots. They take place in, in Nottinghamshire in, in England. And uh, you can see these guys sort of breaking these primitive machines. It's the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. And clearly they are worried about, or one of the things that they were worried about is that these machines would kick them uh, out of a job. But it isn't just the workers, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, from the, sort of the, the most eminent 
economist of his time, and one of the founders of modern economics, David Ricardo, who basically um, admitted, and this is in a, in a chapter he inserted in the third volume of third edition of his book, so clearly he thought about this a long time, and he says, substitution of machinery for human labor is often very injurious to the interest of the class of laborers. It may render the population redundant and deteriorate the condition of the laborer, okay? So this is, this is 1821. And then he has this even more apocalyptic letter in which he writes to somebody else that if machinery could do all the work that labor now does, there would be no demand for labor and uh, nobody would, would be entitled to consume anything who was not a capitalist. And so this is, this, this is a very sort of scary kind of view. And it's perhaps not surprising that the greatest disciple that Ricardo had in the 19th century was called Karl Marx. So, you know, uh, this is something to, to think about. But, as it turned out, this was wrong. <laughs> I mean, there is zero evidence that in the 19th century, either Ricardo's fears or the Luddites' concerns uh, were, uh, uh, were a reality. Of course, it is true, and I'll talk about this, that in the transition from one technology to another, there are always people who suffer. Okay, so this is what I would call sort of the transitional uh, dynamics. But what happened in the 19th century in Britain, and then later on on the continent, and in North America, and everywhere else, uh, is that you get these, these occupations that become redundant, handloom weavers, nail makers, framework knitters, I mean, I can give you a long list if you want to, but they find other jobs, jobs that really couldn't be imagined in 1821. Railroad engineers, uh, electricians, telegraph operators. You know, the, I mean, you can make a long list of occupations that just don't exist in 1820, but are there in uh, 1900. Another option that these people had, and that many of them took advantage, of course, is to immigrate. That's of course, an issue that, <laughs> the option that may, not, may no longer exist in our time, but certainly in the 19th century, uh, it did. And so every generation, I think, that came after basically knew this history and they realized that in the past it's never happened, but they say, well, this time it's different. Um, and so a different way of looking at this is basically to say, look, we understand that if this technological change is happening, in the long run it benefits everybody. But in the short run, because some people are being displaced and because there is disruption going on, um, it may be costly. But maybe with the speed up of technological progress, that it goes faster and faster, these costs of disruption become harder and harder to overcome. And that is, I think, a serious concern that I will try to address. So here is some 20th century stuff. So this is from the New York Times in 1928, mind you. 1928 is a year before the Great Depression started. So there's basically very little unemployment in the US. But it says, prevalence of unemployment with greatly increased industrial output points to the influence of labor-saving devices as an underlying cause. So this is right before the Depression even has started, okay? And then this debate, and a very nice book by a historian uh, about this, uh, clearly becomes much more intense in the 1930s when there is a huge amount of unemployment in the American economy. Now, I can tell you with utmost authority that the unemployment in the 1930s in the US was not caused by automation or by technological progress. It was caused by financial collapses and by mismanagement and by whole things. The Great Depression is not caused by technological progress. But when people lose their jobs, they're looking for a scapegoat. And they're looking for an explanation. And this seems convenient. And what is even more convenient is that it's the, the cause of unemployment is basically by inhuman kind of devices. So here is an example of this, OK? This is, I think, from the uh, early 1930s. You can sort of see this robot, you know, and it says, no help wanted, which is, you know, clearly <laughs> depicted in such a way as to to bear a vague resemblance with a human being, but it makes very clear to you that this is not, this thing is not human. You know, you see these, 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 these pipes stinging out, out of his brain, okay? Here is another 
<laughs> just to say that this is not just the hoi palloi that's making this point. This is, an, this is a, a, a speech by, by uh, Einstein given in 1931 in Berlin of all places, uh, in which he basically says that industrial technique, which was meant to serve the world's progress by liberating mankind from the slavery, was now ab about to overwhelm its creators. Okay, by and then he talks about the great distress of the present time, which is unemployment, of course, as by man-made machines. So this is not, you know, some yo-yo from left field. This is, you know, the greatest intellect of the, of the 20th century, and, you know, this is what he says, so you have to take this seriously. Here is another quote that I really like. This is from a novelist called Sherwood Anderson, also 1931. And uh, so engineering has taken from us the work from our hands. The ages move too fast, and modern men have lost their maleness. That's scary. Uh, <laughs> and but it says, you know, this is the machine efficiency that has done this to us. All right, well, here is a cartoon, this is, you can see, very much like the previous one. This is from 1940, so this is at the end of the Depression, when finally unemployment is bouncing back. And so new studies cited as an old argument, and here the, the term technological employment is actually uh, used. So the term, obviously, is, uh, is around. And now you can see in 1940, is the robot beginning to think? You know, that must sound somewhat familiar to, to people here in, in, in McCormick. And so you would think that after, the during and after the war, when unemployment is very low and basically the country is at full employment for, for, for many years to come, uh, that this, is, this thing would fade. But it doesn't. There's a famous memo that was put out in 1964 by the sort of, by the, was known as the ad hoc committee on the triple revolution. Among the signatures was a, uh, the great Linus Pauling himself, as well as some economists of note, Gunnar Myrdal, who eventually won the Nobel Prize, and Robert Heilbronner. And they basically told uh, President Johnson in 1964 that unemployment was going to go up because of the cybernation revolution. You know, that's a term I don't think anybody uses anymore, but in 64, this was really uh, a scary kind of thing. So all these predictions were made over and over again. And didn't happen. <laughs> the streets were never filled with the unemployed ex-farmers and ex-factory workers. Um, you know, it, it never happened. Which is, you know, something we're thinking about, you know. But it, that doesn't prove it can't happen. It just says it didn't. Um, and so the debate has been, I think, let me sort of try to clarify the debate a little bit. The first is, does technological progress cause a long-term decline in the demand for labor and therefore in employment? And if so, how big is it? Is it, and is it happening just in one industry that is particularly subject to technological progress? Does it happen in the entire economy? And well, you know, the system eventually adjusts, as some economists still believe, that the system always adjusts to full employment. Uh, and the second is, what about the short-term effect? So, even if the total demand for labor in the long term is unchanged, what technological change will typically do is it will increase the demand for some skills and reduce the demands for other skills. And so you may get mismatches. You may have, you know, then where everybody needs engineers and chemists and, you know, surgeons, but all we have is, is former steel workers and, 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 and coal mine workers, and they can, we can just switch them right away. So that leads to all kind of an, an unemployment, even though the economy is actually short of labor. That's quite likely to happen. And so, why then is it that this never happened? And I think we, here are sort of four reasons, and I probably can think of more if you push me hard enough. Okay. But the main reasons why this didn't happen is the first is, of course, that as factory jobs and industrial jobs were automated, there was an emergence of new occupations and tasks. The other thing that's worth talking about is that of course pro there was productivity growth, but it was never so fast that its system couldn't um, adjust. And so, for instance, the, the, big, the, big, the biggest shock, I think, to, to the economy 
in modernization is the decline of agriculture. You know, on the eve of the Civil War, 50% of all Americans worked in agriculture. Today, it's less than 2%. Okay, so that's a vast decline. Where did all these farmers go? Well, they eventually, obviously, found jobs outside of agriculture. But because this movement was slow enough, you know, there was time for them to move. And if not one generation, the next generation went to the city. The third thing, which is worth pointing out, is that if the demand for labor went down, one consequence would be that we would be working less. And it so happened that that is the case. The number of hours that a typical worker in the industrialized world, either the United States or Europe, is working today per year has fallen by half compared to 1900. In 1900, it's somewhere around 3,000 hours a year. You can do the math, and you can see there's not much room for vacation there. Uh, and today, depending a bit on where you are, in Europe, it's somewhere around 1450. In the United States, it's somewhere about 1650. Roughly speaking, it's half. But actually, that's an underestimate. It's an underestimate because as a percentage of your life, the number of years that you work has come down because people start later. They go to college, much larger number go to college, and many of them go to graduate school and so on and so forth, and they retire. You know, in 1900, the number of people who could actually retire at 60 or 65 was very small. Today, it's very high. And so, as a percentage of the days that you live, you know, the, the um, percentage of, of, of hours that you work has declined. So people just work less and enjoy more leisure, which is actually what Economics, of course, would predict that income goes up. And finally, there's a matter of participation rates, but then the story is complicated because, of course, what we observe in the 20th century is more women are working. Uh, that, that, that's happened in the, particularly after the years after 1945. But on the other hand, child labor has disappeared and people start later and later. So that may, these sort of may uh, balance out. Okay, so so much for history. And now, Maybe this time it's different. Um, if the rate of, of, um, of technological progress is accelerating, and um, the scary thing is not, I think, so much that the overall demand for labor will decline, but it is hollowing out phenomenon. And the hollowing out phenomenon basically says that all the economy needs is people who are very, very skilled, sort of PhDs and en trained engineers and chemists and doctors and people like that, and the people who wash dishes and clean hotel rooms and cut lawns. But the jobs in between are slowly going to disappear. So this is a, an article that appeared in the New York Times three days ago. Hang on, there it is. Okay, so th 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 this is, came out on February 4th, so yeah, a week ago. Uh, and so you can find this article, I mean, it's by a guy who writes about, about economics. And basically, it's very much about this hollowing out phenomenon. Okay? So, so the jobs that stay are at the, at the extremes of the skill spectrum, but the ones in between will disappear. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it, it's a good question. You know, could this or, couldn't, or could this not happen? So let me make... Uh, an observation which says essentially that to insofar that innovation is going to be primarily process innovation which is and labor saving uh, it may and in fact it probably likely will be to make some jobs redundant that they are replaced by some form of automated machinery whether robots or, 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 or something like that and of course the concern is that AI will make this a lot worse because AI will replace not only manual jobs but also fairly simple routine jobs that, that require uh, mental ability. So, you know, things like legal assistants, bank officials, uh, uh, drivers, and so on. Now, so far, this has been, so been promised now for, for five or six years since AI went through the great breakthroughs in the, uh, about a decade ago. It hasn't happened yet. And in fact, more and more people know about AI. Uh, 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 
tell, like this guy, Organizioni, for instance, who is a uh, guru on, on uh, basically say this, it's not happening. Maybe it might happen still, but it's not happening so far. Uh, and yet, here is a very pessimistic view. This is a paper by two economists called Frey and Osborne, came out five years ago. Basically, they promised us that about 50% of all US jobs could be automated away. So if that's the case, you know, then you know, there is some reason to worry. Uh, now, so far, I think the evidence on that is skimpy. Uh, what seems to be happening is that as technological change happens, even process innovation, which makes good uh, cheaper, uh, what we see is not so much that workers are being kicked out of the system, but many of them are being moved to tasks which are not yet automated. So this is uh, the most famous example of that. This is Jim Besson, who is an economist at BU. And he basically has this famous example about bank tellers. And you can sort of see when ATM machines are being introduced in banks, uh, you would think that the tellers would all be fired because you know, an ATM machine does what a teller used to be. But they're not. Now, the number of tellers actually is more or less constant. It even rises a little bit. Then it goes down a tad. But there's no collapse. In what's happening? Well, the answer is that many people who were tellers before uh, are now dealing with customer relations. And they talk to customers. And they, talk, you know, they, they do projects. They do various things. Some of them good. Some of them maybe not so good. But, 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 but clearly, they have got more interesting jobs than just counting $20 signs. right? And, uh, uh, at Wells Fargo, it sort of went bad, right? <laughs> but uh, never mind. Uh, but you know, but this is happening happened to a lot of, of these positions. You know, you look at at switchboard operators. Okay, you know, hundred years, well, eighty years ago, you made a phone call, you went through an operator, right? You say, operator, give me that and that number. Well, that's unthinkable. These jobs are all completely disappeared. But these switchboard operators weren't all fired; they moved up to different positions. No, receptionists, you know, we have typists who became administrators, on and on and on. So that's the kind of thing that happens. And if that's what happens, it's not really the end of the world. So here is what's going to count here. This is, this is where economics comes in a little bit. So the questions that an economist would ask is first, are these machines a close substitute for labor? Or are they more in terms of complement in the sense that they make labor more productive. And that's going to differ from task to task and from job to job. Secondly, how quick will the substitution be? The third is, what are the demand elasticities, which means basically that if, you know, if there's technological change happening and the goods get a lot cheaper, then in fact people may buy so much more of them that the number of jobs actually goes up, even though each worker produces a lot more units. That's quite possible. Then there is what, you know, the, that the general, what we call the general equilibrium effect, which basically means, well, even if in one industry demand for labor goes down, people are going to spend their money on some other industry or some other service, and so the demand for labor may actually go up and not down. So there's this paper by David Otor and Anna Salomon, which actually calculates that. And what they show is that in the industries in which technological progress has been the most rapid, okay, you actually see decline in labor, but that is fully compensated for by an increase in the demand for labor and other things. And finally, and this is something that I'm making a big deal out of, I seem to be the only one, is how important is product innovation uh, compared to process innovation. So process innovation basically says we're making goods cheaper. And product innovation says we're making things that nobody made before. And when that's the case, it's very hard to know if it's saving labor or not. And so what product innovation, and that would include, of course, services, means is new jobs are created that nobody could have imagined 50 or 100 years ago. So you know, I, I tell my students, you know, think, make this mental experiment. Okay? In 1914, my great-grandmother, if you would tell her that her great-grandchildren would be video game designers or cybersecurity experts, or, you know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of these jobs that exist now. I mean, I didn't even know 
that there, that there are veterinary psychiatrists, but there are. And there are geriatric occupational therapists, not just occupational therapists, geriatric or, okay, for people like me. And so, you know, that, that, those are new positions that, that come around that have been made possible largely by new technology or new knowledge, you know, whatever you want to call it. That, I think, is what we have to think about, you know, how project the, 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 the growth from 1914 to today into 2050 or to 2100. And think about it. Okay, we, clearly, that's where our imagination falls short. And here's what we know with, for certainty. One, the transition will not be painless. And it was never painless. There were always people who paid the price for the disruption. <sighs> and the bad news is, and this is sort of a typical economist way of thinking about it, human capital is what we call putty clay. Meaning that once it's formed, okay, once you have been trained, and you know, you're, you're in your, it's very hard and becomes increasingly harder to switch to a new occupation. Of course, anybody can become a hamburger flipper or anything like that, and that is what the concern is. But if you take you know, a 57-year-old steel plant worker and say, sorry, we're closing the plant, you know, the likelihood that at that age you say, all right, well, my services are no longer required. I'm going to become a dental hygienist. That's not terribly likely to happen to somebody who is 57, okay? So, and what is happening, of course, and this is something that I am truly concerned about, is that the population is aging, right? In every industrialized country, the United States isn't the worst of it. You know, you look at places like South Korea uh, and, 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 and Italy, and the population is <laughs> very few kids born. People live ever longer. So as the median age of the population goes up, so does the median age of the labor force. And so you have a situation in which you have older and older dogs whom, to whom it is hard to teach new tricks. That's the bad news. The good news is that if we know anything about technological progress, it is that the jobs that are replaced by machines, on average, not all of them, but on average, tend to be the worst jobs. They tend to be physically exhausting, to be tedious, dangerous, noisy, unhealthy, you, you name it. These aren't jobs you want to have. Um, and so even the low quality jobs today are probably far better than they used to be. You know, people used to work in farming and you know, you actually stand there out there in the sun for 10 hours in the heat and you know, you're doing physical labor that breaks your back. Today you work in agriculture, you're probably sitting in an air conditioned tractor, you know, doing your email or listening to, uh, uh, to Spotify or something like that. So you still have to be there, but it's not as bad as it used to be, right? That's the, that's the argument. Um, and so all the jobs that are being threatened uh, today, not all, but many of them, you know, they're not terribly attractive jobs. Um, the one I, I like sometimes to, to focus on is the great fear, what's going to happen to truckers, you know, when we have self-driving cars. Oh, it will be a disaster, you know, you know mil millions of truckers will be thrown out in the street. Uh, for one thing, the people that express those fears have never div driven a truck themselves, okay? And it isn't all that much fun to drive a truck, particularly not a long, boring highway through Ohio in the winter. You know, I mean, this is not the job you want. But still, driving a truck today is a hell of a lot better than it was 50 years ago, right? You know, the truck is air conditioning, it's well heated, you know, you've got stereo, you've got, you know, uh, uh, Bluetooth. I mean, it's, it's better than it used to be. But if these jobs are eliminated, you know, I mean, it's, it's not the job people want. And so my sense is that more and more of these lousy jobs are going to be promoted to more fulfilling, more challenging, more pleasant work. Maybe not across the board in every one, single one of them, but a lot will be. And so, more important is that it may liberate many workers from what Keynes used to call the Adamite curse. The Adamite curse, which he doesn't specify, by the way. We won't know what the Adamite curse was, because if you go back to the book of Genesis, the Adamite curse is that in the sweat of thy brow thou shalt eat bread. Right? That's the, the, the curse that 
the penalty that God gave to Adam and Eve for violating his rules. And Keynes basically said, you know, what technology will do for us is it will relieve us of that. Us of that. Now, that's a different way of looking at Kurt Vonnegut's playing piano, but it's not, not a bad way. Now, a little bit about robots. The evidence today does seem to suggest that in the United States, robots are a threat to jobs. There are some classic papers now by now by Darren Samoglu and, and a co-author who basically used a the regional difference in difference analysis and basically calculate that every robot that's introduced is replacing somewhere between three and six jobs. And so this is what they call the displacement effect. Robots displace workers. However, if you look at another country like Germany, which has more robots than the United States has because it's so heavily concentrated on machinery and automobiles, the evidence is that the robots do not nearly displace, displace as many jobs. Also, they do affect wage growth fairly, um, uh, fairly strongly. And so what perhaps the upshot of the, this research is that no matter whether it goes through employment or through wages, what automation does, it, it reduces the share of workers, of labor, in GDP. And it increases the share on those people who own capital, including the robots. Now, it's not clear that this is the good news or the bad news. Um, if you own a robot, it's obviously a good news. But if you all know about Gates' uh, plan to tax the robots, my sense is that whatever we're going to do, the profits made by the people who automate are essentially rents. And these rents can be taxed without any sort of serious repercussions in the economy. You know, I know this. Uh, this issue came up at Davos a couple of weeks. I wasn't there, but <laughs> uh, and and Michael Dell, you know, had talk, talked about it. Oh, this is a terrible idea, but he doesn't explain why this is a terrible idea. It's not clear if you took away, you know, 70 percent or 80 percent of Michael Dell's income, whether he wouldn't do exactly the same, which is the definition of of an economic rent. Now, the other consideration, of course, and this already I hinted at, is labor supply. And so these people are really worried here about the, the labor demand. But in fact, the big concern we have is shortages of labor. And we all know why. We know because the population is aging, because fewer people are working, uh, because of we are, every country, industrialized countries, is reducing immigration due to one form of nativism or another. And therefore, we get higher dependency ratio, essentially meaning that the more people not working either because they are too young or too old, relative to the people actually working. That is a, a serious consideration. And if, that, if that's the case, the problem is not unemployment, it's labor shortages. And so maybe we should wish for more robots to replace the workers we don't have. That's, I think. But now, before I sort of let you go, take the worst case analysis, OK? Suppose. This is really this bad dystopia comes to beer, and you know, as Skidelsky, a famous British economist, said, sooner or later we'll run out of jobs. What's that going to do? So, you know, the first is to think a little bit more about work. And I think uh, economists sort of like to think about work as something that you have to do that gives you negative utility or disutility in order to make income. And I think this is something we should have ab abandoned a long time ago. I mean, Martin Luther in the 16th century basically said that your occupation is your calling, or what he called the vocatio, you know. And so it's, it's, it's a source of identity. It's a source of pride. It's who you are and what you do for society. And it's a way of making social connections, right? The sort of water cooler effect. Where do you make friends? Where do you meet people? Um, the second thing is not only what happens to work, but what happens to jobs? You know, will people in the future have jobs? And I should like to point out that the notion of a job is a fairly recent one. So, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, people worked. Here are two, you know, pictures. This is a 16th century picture, this is a 15th century picture. These people are working, 
But they don't have jobs. Okay, for you, <laughs> people didn't have jobs. A job is a one-on-one -on -one contractual relation between an employer and an employee. And that kind of thing, with very few exceptions, really emerges only during and after the Industrial Revolution, after, say, 1780 or something uh, like that. People didn't have jobs. They worked, but they didn't have jobs. They worked mostly for themselves. So if you want, they were part of this gig economy. In fact, the whole world was one big gig economy. People worked for themselves. They didn't feel like getting out of bed. They didn't open the workshop. They didn't go to the field. That was, they, you know, that was their prerogative. Of course, they wouldn't make any money, so that's the, the, that's the trade-off. So, basically, the advantage of the gig economy is, of course, that you can choose exactly when you work and when you don't work and how much money uh, you make. And so, what exactly is meant by work, therefore, is having a job and working are not the same. And it's perfectly possible, ladies and gentlemen, that the pendulum of gig versus job is swinging back. Now, I tried to figure out how big the gig economy is, and nobody seems to know because nobody seems to know exactly you know, how to define it. But clearly, we all feel intuitively, if you've taken an Uber, you know that, that there are, it's bigger now than it used to be. Whether it will take over the whole economy or not, I, uh, I don't know. But clearly, there are lots of ways of getting from uh, to other ways what we get from work. People don't need anymore to go to, a, to work to make social connections. They can do so through social media, for instance, which is something that's only been coming in the last 20 years. And so, in the limit, how much will people work? And I can see this dystopia in which there are not enough jobs in which there's many, many years, maybe centuries in the future, in which the only people who work are people who want to, not people who, who have to. Okay? They like the work, and they will all do some kind of volunteer work. And in fact, we are partially there. About 25% of all Americans now do some kind of volunteer work. They go to work, they do what they're told, they, they show up on time, they do everything, except they don't get paid. Why? Because it gives them a sense of fulfillment and gives them a self satisfaction and they get to meet people. So we could go to a world in which this is even higher and higher. Of course, the big question is what would these people live on? Okay, and I haven't <laughs> solved that one. The other thing that I want to point out is that not working isn't what it used to be. And that the 20th century has witnessed the biggest revolution in leisure technology we have ever seen. I mean, and in fact, leisure technology really didn't change very much since the Romans. And the Romans had these circuses in which they had people, you know, uh, f watch gladiators fighting each other, or it was even more fun, little boys fighting, you know, lions and tigers. This was a great, great fun. You know, in the 19th century America, they had similar things. Uh, you know, we had in the United States, eye-gouging contest, you know. Well, that sounds like fun to me. I mean, even... So, you know, we st this is, you know, people still play card, but there wasn't all that much to do. And if you read accounts of, of unemployed people in the past, the biggest thing was boredom. Well, you know, we now have so much entertainment technology, all the way from massive spectator sports to essentially unlimited sources of movies, you know, plays, art, sophisticated video games, on and on and on and on and on. You know, it's not so bad not to work. There's a paper by Eric Hurst at the University of Chicago who raised the question, why are people who at the, their Prime age, this is male workers between age 20 and 30, I believe. So this is known as prime aged males, right? So this is that's a technical term. And their labor force participations have been going down. And why aren't these people working, even if they're not in college? They're not working. Why not? And the answer they gave, you know what they're doing? They're playing video games <laughs> in their mother's basement. <laughs> and this is fine. I mean, this is, this is what they want to do. I'm not sure this is something I would do. 
But I would say if people choose to do so, this is probably a welfare improvement. And so technological change has been complementary to leisure. I mean, we have, you know, you look at the medical advances. Oh, we, we, uh, look today, I mean, you look at the complementarity between, say, joint replacement and golfing, hearing aids and concerts, <laughs> bypass surgery and, 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 and cataract surgery and tourism. You know, the, clearly technology is making leisure more enjoyable. Here is one graph I like. This is what people do when they're not working. This is the number of international tourist arrivals from 1996 to, this would be, I think, 2000, what is it, 2018. So you can see this curve going up by a factor of three. You know, this is what leisure looks like today. It could be worse. There you go, those are the numbers. So I already, I already talked about this. I may, I may uh, skip all this. And so here's another quote from Leontief. I'll be done in a minute. Uh, and he said this. This is a very nice quote. He says, those who ask what the average working man and woman could do with so much free time forget that in Victorian England, the upper classes did not seem to have been demoralized by their idleness. Some went hunting, some others engaged in politics, and still others created po the greatest poetry and literature and science the world has known. Now, this is, I don't know why he says this about Victorian England. This is just as true for the Roman Empire or for Renaissance Florence or for whatever. You know, the people who didn't work weren't necessarily living empty, boring lives, but they created things. Now, here's Keynes again in this famous essay called Pos Economic Possibilities for Grandchildren. And so here's what he says. You know, for the first time since his creation, sorry for the sexist language, this is 1930, um, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won, blah, 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 blah. Mind you, this is before it all started, and he can see this coming from uh, a mile away. So people will still work a little bit. Three-hour shift of a 15-hour week. Sounds good to me. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe enough to put the problem for a great while. That should be enough to satisfy the old Adam in most of us. So this, is, again, is an issue not entirely new. This is a book written over a century ago, sort of a classic book. And here is a painting that tells you how awful it is to not to work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>